Uh, good morning and welcome to the 31st meeting of the committee in 2014. Everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting system. Some committee members may use tablets during the course of the meeting. Uh, that's because we provide papers in digital format. Agenda item one um, is to decide whether or not to uh, take item three in private. Can we agree to take that item in private? Agreed. Thank you very much. Agenda item two um, is oral evidence session on the Scottish Government 2015-16 draft budget. Uh, we have two panels giving evidence this, after, this morning. Uh, we have received apologies from Sue Bruce, Chief, Chief Executives of the City of Edinburgh Council, who cannot attend this morning. I'm sure the committee members would like to join me in sending Sue Bruce our best wishes. Um, I'd like to welcome the first panel. They are Councillor Kevin Keenan, uh, Finance Spokesperson, and Vicky Bibby, Team Leader for Finance of COSLA, Hugh Dunn, Head of Finance, City of Edinburgh Council, Roddy Burns, Chief Executive of Murray Council, uh, and Lindsay Freeland, Chief Executive of South Lanarkshire Council. Uh, welcome to you all and uh, good morning. Uh, would any of you like to make a brief opening statement? Prepared to go for it. You're just prepared to go for it. This is what we... Oh, Mr Dunn. I would just like to confess Sue's apologies to the committee. She was very... She welcomed the invitation to give evidence and is very, was very much looking forward to giving evidence. But she had an accident last night, which meant that she's been detained in the hospital overnight. So um, just um, to pass on that message to the committee. Well, we wish her uh, a speedy recovery, uh, Mr Dunn, and I hope you, that you can uh, pass, it, pass that on to her. Um, we certainly understand the, the circumstances. Um, can I ask uh, the opening question then? Uh, can I ask to what extent the current funding formula uh, and method of distribution to local authorities is fit for purpose? Um, Councillor Keenan, do you want to go first of all? I think it's hard to, to put in a few words, obviously, whether it's fit for purpose or not. I would probably, it's difficult to, as a councillor, to go into the issues of distribution. What I would say is that as the settlement is a tight settlement, then individual councils, as they try to uh, meet the aspirations of their public in their area, will find it more and more difficult. Hence the reason that distribution issues, if anything, caused with some issue at COSLA, and as money gets tighter, then they're magnified. Uh, people obviously would always like the maximum amount of money, and uh, that at the moment, because there's a lack of it, doesn't appear to be the case. Uh, we've seen uh, last year uh, a number of councils threaten to um, leave COSLA um, over um, the settlement and distribution. Have those matters been resolved, Councillor Keenan? There, there is, there is uh, still a number of people that have given notice to leave COSLA. Uh, obviously, COSLA are doing what they can to bring these members back on board. It is a members' organisation, and obviously we'd like to best represent all local authorities. But it's up to each individual council as to how they feel uh, best placed. I would think that in distribution issues, then uh, uh, some, some councils' distribution issue in, in relation to their feelings of COSLA are probably different uh, uh, between one and the other. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else wish to come in on that? Mr Dunn? I think looking at it from the local authority side, the distribution method is well understood and I think it works quite effectively. There's sometimes inf information, um, more robust information on more Recent data would be helpful in certain distribution methods, but I think generally the distribution method is well understood. It's a needs assessment basically um, based on certain indicators. So I think that is understood. As um, the councillor said, the, the main issue just now is the quantum of funding rather than the distribution of that, I would say, from an Edinburgh point of view. The City of Edinburgh, of course, um, does not do particularly well out of the current funding formula. Um, and now you have the advantage, of course, of the 85% floor. Has that been beneficial? The 85% floor has been beneficial. In the first year, 
from memory, when it first came in, it gave us around about 21, 22 million. But with the recent settlement for next year, that has been reduced down to about 10, 11 million. But it is extra funding that brings us up to the 85 per capita rule, so it is helpful. The reasons for Edinburgh getting less money in other authorities is due to the kind of distribution method and the client base of that, but that's understood as well. Uh, Mr Burns, do you have a, a view from Murray? I think the view from Murray is that given what the distribution has to do in trying to um, distribute across the urban, the rural, the needs uh, and all the other factors to be taken into account, I, I think it is unbalanced for, for, for that purpose. But it is a question of, of, of quantum, as has been mentioned by my colleague. Mr Freeland. Thank you. Just to just to echo that, I think as the quantum of cash, I mean, I think the distribution model we have to find a way of distributing it across 32 local authorities. Um, the problem moving from flat cash to that needs based system is that a number of local authorities lost out as a result of that in, in the first year of that. In addition to that, I think there's a comparative data which is still being used. I think is it 2001. Um, I know there's plans to change that and there's work on going to change that, but right now you're still using data which comes from 2001 for some of that um, calculation. In addition to that, um, there's a constant demand and a growth in demand in the system. So even if our, in South Lanarkshire, our population goes up, it might not go up um, and relative to other local authorities. So where we're still dealing, or we would be dealing with a higher population base, our distribution or the amount of, the amount of cash through that distribution method might go down because we don't go up as much as others. So still that, we're dealing with more but getting less because of our comparative data. Mark, is this on this particular topic? Um, OK, if I can continue on, I'll take you in in a second. Um, you've talked uh, about pressures. Obviously, there are demographic pressures, um, which may, may be helped by the integration of health and social care. Um, we also uh, have seen um, welfare reform. How, how um, are these issues um, affecting uh, local authorities in terms of budgeting? Councillor Keenan, do you want to go first, or Ms Bibby? I, mean, I think that uh, in Dundee, obviously, and I can only really speak for Dundee, I think they've tried to do what they can to mitigate uh, the effects or the worst effects of some of the changes that are coming into place. I think in uh, instance where, obviously, we have uh, trying to get people to sign up for uh, discretionary housing payments have been difficult. There are some people still having to come forward. And we've spent a lot of officers' time, uh, and individual time, uh, you know, trying to make sure that people... Uh, try to do whatever they can to help themselves. There is a, uh, an element of individuals that still don't come forward for that. Uh, you know, so there's, there, there's, that's just one area of, of work where uh, we've, we've tried to do what we can to, to, to mitigate the worst effects of council tax. But certainly people uh, present themselves different in poverty and, with, uh, like other councils, uh, give some money to prop up food banks and the like in the area as well. So there's a real issue in uh, addressing uh, deprivation. Ms Bibby, um, do you have any information from members as a whole? Um, I suppose it's just to add that health and social care budgets um, are, um, and councils will probably speak for themselves on this, um, the pressures are significant. Um, and I think you rightly mentioned health and social care agenda, and I think that's key going forward, that we look at health in the widest sense, don't just focus in on the NHS, and it's the pressures on health, um, particularly the social care side of things, that are going to put significant pressure on local government and welfare. the partnerships going forward. And welfare reform? Um, well, yes, welfare reform is a significant pressure for um, local government. Mr Freeland, please. So welfare reform, yeah, there's been a lot done to try to mitigate it. I mean, we've had money from DWP and from Scottish Government to help mitigate it. Um, a lot of cash going into actually advice, etc., rather than going direct to, um, going direct to claimants. Um, in addition to that, when UC comes in, when Universal Credit comes in, I'm aware it's going on in, I think it's nine pilot authorities um, next year, when Universal Credit comes in, then there'll be the issue about what impact that has in Council's budgets, perhaps through non-payment, because the UC will go direct to claimants. So that hasn't been factored into the system yet. It might increase bad debt, etc. That's an unknown, unknown, if you like. Um, but I think local authorities generally across Scotland have worked very well to try and mitigate the impact on welfare reform, but at a high cost, though, I would say. Um, 
In terms of health and social care integration, I think Vicky's point is sound. Uh, the pressure on the system will continue in terms of health budgets, etc. Um, when we talk about community health and local authorities funding through social work, the old bed block debate, etc. In relation to that, I mean, to get people out of beds, it's not all just about um, care homes and care at home. There's other issues in the health service which need to be resolved. But if you take the, the impact on local authorities, the local authority social work budget is finite. So every time that somebody needs out of hospital, then if something comes off the other end, that's fine as a balancing act. But the demand is constant, and it continues to be constant. If we make targets a five-day target to um, unlock a bed, if you like, well, that's a, that's, a, that's a cost in some cases to a local authority, and it's a continual cost. I mean, we've propped the budget up over the last two years by millions of pounds, but we've still got... Um, still not meeting, in some cases, the bed blocking target, and that is would just continue until m more money is released from the system. The principle of integrated working in terms of trying to free up efficiencies, I think, is sound, but that will take a bit of time to bed in before you actually start to release um, those efficiencies in the system. You talked about demand there and demand increasing. Um, have your services moved to more needs-led budgeting rather than demand-led budgeting, can I ask? Yeah, I mean, in terms of it's a universal service provision, but there is kind of elements of that which are uh, needs-based. For example, in terms of home care, we're now trying to introduce a kind of a grading system, you know, like an assessment system. We try to do um, people that need home care on demand, but the kind of criteria or the threshold for that might have to change as we go forward just because of the budget constraints. OK, thank you. Mr Burns, please. I'm really just echoing um, what Mr Flynn has said. In, in terms of welfare reform, I think... Again, speaking perhaps more from a small, small authority, there's a real intensity about the work uh, in order to mitigate um, the, the welfare reform uh, issues. So that's around working very closely with housing colleagues and other services to get to the people uh, at a very early stage to ensure they understand what the reform might mean to them. Uh, and as I say, that's required quite an intensity of, of work, not just the overall workload, but the intensity of that work. Um, again, in terms of health and social care, uh, sometimes there are other pressures which are indirect in some senses, but quite vital to delivering the services. For example, and I don't think money is unique in this, um, there's quite often recruitment and retention issues in terms of carers, for example, uh, and it can only take some of the supermarkets doing a pre-Christmas drive and recruitment, and suddenly staff will, will move across to that sector and move out of the care sector. Murray does have a low-wage economy, and that is is one of the features of that. People do move for what might seem relatively small sums of money, but they are quite significant sums to the individuals involved. So even if we have got the money to provide some of the services and some of the interventions, we quite often don't have the people there to do it in sufficient numbers. So that, that's often um, a, a, an issue. And again, just to, to echo what Mr Freeland said about having to sort of grade some levels of care, uh, in, albeit it as a universal service. Thank you. Mr Dunn, please. Just on the kind of demographics area, in Edinburgh there's probably two main areas of demographic um, pressures coming through on a flat settlement, one being increases in um, young people going to primary schools, pupil numbers in primary schools are increasing, and the other one is, is on health social care, the demographics. An example is in Edinburgh we're trying to increase care at home by 1% per month just now, so over the year we're trying to increase the amount of care at home packages, hours of service by 12%, which is effectively 5,000 hours a week. And that's the kind of demand we are facing. As part of the budget process, we have tried to recognise that in our budget, and we have provided £9 million as part of the kind of budget we see if we have to provide the service based on the need that we see. So in our overall budget just now, what we have done is put an extra £9 million, and then that forms part of the deductions we need in the overall budget next year of £22 million to try to fund this growing demand that we know is out there, and we can see it. And we've actually done things like increase the rate of pay, or the rate we pay to outside providers of care from £14.10 to £15.50, just trying to get that demand in the market to get that, because it is quite a tight labour market in Edinburgh, to get that supply, because it is what we need to do is get care in the community and take people out of hospital beds, etc., which is more expensive. So that's what we're trying to do, and we've tried to recognise that in our budget going forward by putting this £9 million per annum incrementally into our next three years' budget. But then that creates pressures elsewhere, because where do we find that in a flat settlement? Do you think that um, changes to community planning partnerships is uh, 
uh, laid out in the Community Empowerment Bill uh, will help uh, share resources um, and lead to better integration in terms of things like health and social care. Can I start with Mr Dunn this time, please? I think it's early days and that. There's possibilities there and it's probably sort of an area we need to look at as uh, the bill comes through and we actually look at what the possible solutions are. But it does give you some a possibility to look at that. And going forward, community capacity is a big issue. How do we increase community capacity um, to help us look at these kind of pressures we see coming through for services? So it is a tool in the toolbox that we'll look at. Mr Burns. I think, again, early days, I, I, certainly, Murray, I think it's a question of beginning to understand what the available resources are uh, and the assets are across the wider partnership, uh, and then trying to understand uh, are they meeting the priori priorities, could they be doing something else, uh, and probably more importantly, what should we be doing less of uh, in terms of the, the, the available budgets. Um, so I, I think it is early days. In terms of the community capacity, uh, I know there was comment made in some of the reports about that, but I think some of the third, third sector will be going through their own transition in terms of uh, the third sector interface and a lot of amalgamations and transformation of those services. And again, that's, uh, that's early days there as well in some cases. I, I realise uh, it's early days in some regards that uh, the bill hasn't been passed yet, but has there been any discussions in, in Murray, for example, uh, with other partners about... Um, the pooling of budgets in certain areas? It's the next phase we're going into. Um, we had a series of meetings uh, in the last six weeks or so to finalise uh, the 10-year plan, the 10-year outcome agreement. And the next logical consequence of that uh, is to start sharing resources in order to deliver it. Uh, what the partnership have done is they've given every priority and the targets behind the priority a confidence rating uh, on a one to four scale and clearly in order to get some of the priorities further up the scale that will require the shifting of resources amongst the partnership hence the next phase is actually looking what's on the table uh, amongst the partnership and what can be shifted and reprioritized. I may be being a little bit naive here but one would have thought that if you were actually coming up with the priorities for 10 years um, you would be dealing with the budgetary aspects of that in tandem or else your 10-year plan is going to very quickly uh, see things dropping off of it um, uh, very quickly if the money doesn't come to deal with the, the priorities that are on it. I think the reassurance is that the confidence rating has already picked up those sort of issues because clearly, uh, as I think you're alluding to, there's no point in having a plan if it's a plan to fail. It has to be a plan to deliver uh, the national and the local priorities, and that's exactly what the confidence ratings are set out to do. Mr. Freeland, please. Yeah, I think in terms of the prioritisation and the kind of joint working aspect of community planning, I think everybody agrees with the principle. I think the difficulty becomes when you start to try and articulate the actions that are required to meet those priorities, and you come up against competing interests, if you like, from the organisations that are involved, and you also have the financial. Um, I suppose, barriers and the financial difficulties that some organisations have in terms of trying to meet existing priorities. But in terms of in South Lanarkshire, we are starting to try to articulate those actions in budgetary terms to make sure that we can join up the budgets and also, as Roddy says, and try, and this is a difficult bit, things that have been going on for years perhaps aren't proving to be as effective as they should have been. Therefore, it's a bit about trying to dismantle and move towards a new world, if you like. And that, I think, there's a lot of commitment within the local authority world and in the public sector to that. It's just the kind of, the speed of it perhaps isn't as fast as people would like, but I think um, local authorities and the public sector are committed to that. Councillor Keena. I think uh, you know these really guns talk about Dundee rather than every other area uh, that Cosla represent. But Dundee's got, I believe, a very strong partnership, uh, and I believe that that it will do whatever it can to try to share budgets and uh, and work effectively together. The recently at council we received the the director of social works report, and it obviously spells out in great detail where she sees the cross pressures going in the next few years. And I think that that's done on a pro forma from government. I think it may have been useful if uh, that 25-year projection that, that's built into that report was obviously spelling out some of the financial pressures that uh, that local government are under in this in this particular area. And I think that would have been useful if uh, that was shared with government and indeed obviously shared with the partnership moving forward. I think uh, that kind of figures spelling out the demographic pressures 
uh, would have been useful. I think that would be very interesting for the committee um, to see that. If it were possible to get that documentation for us, uh, I would be immensely the, the, grateful. The, the document, the, I'll get the documentation that is, exists at the moment sent here. I believe it goes to the Scottish Government anyway, but I'll, I'll make sure it gets uh, forwarded on here. The Government didn't necessarily share everything with the committee, That's so if you could shocking. send it to the clerks, Councillor Keenan, that what, would be fantastic. That's what happens to me in opposition. Uh, Ms. <laughs> Ms Bibby, please. Nothing really to add further than what's been said. I mean, I think everybody's absolutely signed up to the principle of community planning and um, we're now at the stages of taking it forward. But, you know, um, it's um, th there's no question about the principle. It's the practicalities of doing it. And it but everyone is signed up to doing it and Cause is very supportive of it. Thank you. Mark MacDonald, please. Well, thank you, Trina. The, um, the issue around the quantum of funding or the amount of money that's being made available has been raised on a number of occasions. Um, every time that we do a budget round, irrespective of which committee it is, and I've sat on a couple of committees doing budget rounds, the organisations affected by that budget will come and they will talk about there not being enough funding available. Now, we live in a situation where we have a fixed budget in Scotland, there are very little wriggle room available. So in order for there to be uh, investment in one area, there has to be disinvestment in another area. This is a scenario that I'm sure local authorities are more than familiar with. Is there a view taken that if uh, the view is that local government requires more funding, if that is the view that is taken, is there a view on where that funding should be taken from? In particular, does COSLA take a position on that? Because it's fine to say more money is required, but without identifying where that more money comes from, it, it doesn't advance things any further, does it? Please. Well, um, I think probably I should pass that over to Councillor Keenan to um, answer that one. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'll have to come out kicking now. So, the the uh, I, I believe that there is uh, a, a real cost pressures in local government, and uh, obviously it is something that needs to be addressed. And I believe that no matter whether it was a great settlement and uh, you doubled it tomorrow, there will be somebody looking for someone else. We'll work in the real world. And the real world is that there is cost pressures there and we try to reshape budgets and do the best we can. Uh, COSLA, I think, are, are starting to form the opinion that you know, the, perhaps the council tax freeze can't exist forever and we need to find some mechanism of local government receiving that bit of extra money. There's the physical empowerment that we've looked at and you know, we would probably ask that government take that serious as we develop it and we develop it together. Uh, as to a way forward for local government to be in a slightly better place financially. Uh, we're prepared to take some of the risks of uh, how uh, these funds would be raised, uh, but I think that it's a conversation that we need to have. Thank you. Mr Freeland, please. Thanks. I, just, I think in terms of um, council tax, for example, in terms of local income collection, that has been frozen for a number of years now. So. Um, one possibility would be to allow council, councils to set their own council tax again. There's a non-domestic rates issue as well, where um, particularly the business rates incentive scheme um, was an incentive for local authorities, which was um, about to be implemented, and then there was, I think they defined it as a significant event. Uh, so the rules changed again on that. In terms of South Lanarkshire's position on that, there was a potential for us to gather about, I think it was approximately £8.5 million pounds worth of additional income had that gone ahead. Um, so I think in terms of local taxation, like council tax and non-domestic rates, it would be helpful to local authorities. Mr Burns, please. I, I think if, if the question has been asked, what can, the, what can the economy afford, then I think that inevitably leads into political choices. Some of them are around taxation issues. They've been mentioned. And I think also around universal service provision, as distinct from universal benefits. Uh, and I think what you begin to see in some of the and that's some of the later questions around budget reduction so far, I think they are almost by default beginning to address some of those issues, particularly in terms of universal services. But it does raise a spectre of, of, of the taxation issues. And Mr Dunn, please. I suppose what it does do is push us to look at alternative ways of delivering services, and you know, things like NHT and Edinburgh has been very successful in providing a number of houses and in a very cost-efficient way compared to maybe previous funding methods. There's also things like Edinburgh are trying to do what's now be called the uh, growth accelerator model and to allow um, the development of the St James Quarter 
and again you're working there and there's things like we're looking at again at the business late incentive scheme so that there's some reward for growth in the economy coming back to local authorities so there's ways that you can maybe do things slightly different than what you have in the past but the quantum no, we accept that the funding out there is difficult, but what we maybe need to do, and we've alluded to it together, is work better together, either with ourselves or with other partners, the health board, etc., to make sure that we are working efficiently and effectively to deliver the outcome. And that's what the people care about, is the outcome, no matter who delivers it. Mr MacDonald. I guess if the BBC is to be believed, we may see some announcement relating to the local taxation issue later on today. Um, just moving slightly away from that, um, in terms of obviously capital expenditure has an impact on revenue expenditure in terms of repayment of, of capital borrowing. One way that has been suggested in the past around that is for local government pension funds to perhaps take a more creative approach, for example, in particular in terms of the delivery of social housing, which obviously has a guaranteed lifetime return and therefore could be viewed by pension funds as a sound investment. I'm aware that some local authority pension funds have taken that approach. Uh, others have been, um, I suppose cautious would be the polite term, uh, risk averse would be the other term, uh, in their approach to that. What, what view do local authorities take around that as a potential approach which would obviously allow for capital funding with, without the revenue impact that would follow. I realise that some of your authorities will be in joint pension arrangements with other authorities and public bodies. Mr Dunn, do you want to start off here, please? I think no pension funds are looking at the possibility and if you look at things like housing, you do get an income stream which matches the kind of liability stream that pensions would need to pay out. So there does seem to be a connection there. But in all these things, it's up to the pension fund to make the best decisions for the pension fund um, employees who will get a pension from that. So they need, they've got a kind of fiduciary duty to these pensioners. But it's something I know, as you say, that pension funds are looking at at the moment. And they'll do that in the light of the investment decisions they want to make. But there is, we have had discussions on that matter. Mr Burns, please. Um, I can't speak on behalf of the, the Grampian Fund, but what I could say is that uh, I would certainly welcome the connection being made between the capital and revenue implications, because I think there's sometimes a presumption that uh, because of the Prudential Code, uh, borrowing is unlimited, clearly is limited ultimately to the revenue available. So I, I do welcome that, um, because I think it's one of the weaknesses whilst the Prudential Code is to be welcomed for someone who remembers the good old bad old days of Section 94. Uh, but clearly anything that can uh, release capital uh, into infrastructure, whether it be housing, uh, to create you know, the productive economy, the efficient economy that I think we all desire, it has to be welcomed. Mr Freeland. Yeah, I think anything that can um, unlock capital is to be welcomed. I think in terms of the pension funds, I don't know if I'm qualified to comment on that. I think in terms of anything they would consider would be in terms of risk. I think in terms of local authority house building, one of the risks for them would be their ability to uh, generate income through rents because of um, kind of social rents, if you like. So it might not be that interesting to them or might not be generate enough return for them. Um, there are other um, ways of doing that. I mean, we have the city deal, which has been announced recently, and we will be beneficiaries of that. I think we'll get approximately £170 million pounds worth of investment in South Lanarkshire. And again, that's by unlocking the taxation system and giving us um, incentives, if you like, um, to spend some council cash. But it's mainly funded by Scottish Government and um, Westminster Government. Uh, Councillor Keenan, please. Uh, I'm on the Pension Investment Fund in Dundee, our Tayside Pensions uh, Fund. And, um, you know, obviously, we have a fiduciary duty to return the best capital that we can for that fund and make sure that the pensioners and uh, deferred pensioners are looked after. Um, we have had the conversation with investment fund managers, and their view would be that uh, it is possible uh, and there would need to be some level of government incentive probably to make that happen. I know that uh, MSP Alec Neil, I think, may well have had a, a conversation uh, with them, uh, although uh, you know it's certainly one that we've had between myself at Cosley, and uh, you know it's uh, uh, probably a wish of his that that would happen. Uh, but obviously, it's about what would they be incentive? How quick would they get their cash back out? Uh, because they might not want to invest in a property for a long term. Uh, so that that was the kind of view the pension fund managers and 
for your fiduciary duty point of view, it would be your wish to disinvest with tobacco, but it delivers a lot of money, and uh, it's something that we're finding it very difficult to be able to do. Ms Bibby, do you have anything Nothing to add? Nothing to add. add in what's been Thank said. you. Uh, Mark MacDonald, please. Um, uh, finally, convener, um, if I can touch on the funding formula. Um, I know we've, we've spoken about that previously with the convener's questioning. Obviously, there was the recent um, situation at COSLA where a vote had to be retaken on making some alterations to the funding formula when a number of authorities realised that they were going to be beneficiaries. The difficulty has always been seen that any real change to the funding formula is unlikely because it essentially is Turkey's voting for Christmas because there are going to be authorities who will lose out as a consequence of that. Um, I realise that um, Mr Dunn was very equivocal in his answer where he said that the funding formula, when he was asked if it was fit for purpose, said it's well understood, uh, which is not necessarily the, the, the same thing. Um, is, is, is the way that funding is allocated via COSLA um, A, appropriate and B, sustainable? particularly in times where funding is going to be tight and there are going to be local authorities pointing fingers around uh, in terms of winners and losers. Uh, Councillor Keenan, please. It's, it's a bit difficult for me to, to say because I'm, I don't have a vote at that. I'm no leader of a council, and it was leaders of the council that took the decision. Uh, I, you know, I think there's an element, as I said earlier, when it comes to distribution that, uh, uh, you know, that... The, because the money being tight, then there's a, there's a real issue. Uh, no matter what the distribution is, nobody thinks they're getting enough anymore. Uh, and it's just because there's so many other things that local government would want to do and the cost pressures that that brings. Uh, as for uh, a sort of statement like flat, flat cash, then the flat cash statement brings the sort of words of it's going to be the same as you got last year. And uh, whether that be any influence on how the vote was taken and then rechanged because it wasn't that, uh, then that might have been the case, but you need to talk to some of the leaders on how they made that decision. I think it's kind of difficult for the chief executives to answer um, the political aspects of the leadership vote, um, but do you have any other comments on Mr Dunn, since you were mentioned uh, by Mr MacDonald? My memory of this was that it, was, it wasn't the distribution method was known about, it was just where you updated the indicators for the latest available information on these indicators. So although the method was understood, the question was whether you would actually update the indicators for the latest information, and that's where the movement between local authorities came about. Mr Freeland, Mr Burns, do you want to add anything? Going Mr. forward, Freeland. it's how you use the data. I mean, in terms of... Um, if the distribution model is based on need, it's how you define that need. I mean, for example, in terms of the schools programme within South Lanarkshire, uh, we've heavily invested at our own cost in the schools. So our schools wouldn't show as being in need, but we'll then lose out on any funding distribution around the school stuff because our school estate is very good and improving all the time. But we decided to make that decision to invest in it from our own resources. Yeah. So are you saying there's an inherent flaw, if you like, in the funding formula that essentially it, it rewards lack of investment or lack of progress. In terms of the school stuff, then, I feel that we have lost it in terms of being an opportunity to bid for additional funding because we took a decision to improve our school estate, and the answer to that is yes. Okay. Uh, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, can I go back to the distribution formula and draw your attention to the uh, submission from Murray Council, where, you know, the, in relation to the concerns with the distribution, or under the heading of concerns with the present distribution formula, the comment I found very intriguing was the main issue isn't with any aspect of the distribution formula, rather the time and energy that is spent by local authorities, COSLA, and the government squabbling mm. over the distribution. <coughs> How would other authorities, and particularly Councillor Keenan, view those comments from Mori Council in relation to distribution formula? Because effectively, what this submission says is distribution formula is fine. It's just that the, the time, effort, and energy are spent arguing over how it's distributed uh, is uh, time-wasting uh, and could be spent better. Difficult for me to answer that. Uh, you know, 
there, there'll be areas if, uh, in Dundee where I think that we would like to see a bit more money coming because we've got a demographic problem that we need to resolve. Uh, it's very difficult for me as a spokesperson, of course, that I give you a, a definitive answer as to how much time spent squabbling. I'm, I'm no part of the distribution. Well, I, I'm, I'm, it's officers that normally spend their time in distribution. Uh, there was recently one in, in uh, a dispute about whether we should give uh, more of a weighting to a rural uh, as opposed to urban. Uh, you know, the matter was resolved. I didn't suppose there was a great amount of cash. Uh, but, however, when things are tight, then obviously people start arguing their corner a wee bit more uh, just to see if there is a better benefit in it for them. Mr. Burns, you must talk about the, the Murray submission in that aspect. Well, I, I think in that aspect... It, it in a way echoes the, the comment uh, in para 122 of your future of local government financing paper and the personal view of the chair of SIP for Directors of Finance. So I, I think it echoes that. I think the other point I would make is if I could maybe go back um, to one of the points that Mr Freely made, uh, because in some senses, um, and I don't know whether it's deliberate or not, but we almost represent you know, two sides of the same coin. And what I mean by that is that Murray was one of the gainers in terms of the, the vote that was retaken. And also in terms of schools, Murray's at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, we haven't spent as much as we ought to have done uh, on schools, and that's because our major investment has been in flood prevention schemes uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, so having invested in that, we're now turning to uh, a schools programme. But you know that doesn't mean to say that Murray hasn't been progressive uh, in a number of areas, it's simply that it was a different priority in which it had to be progressive. Um, so I think it's just uh, reflecting that. And I think also what it's probably reflecting, and it's something I know that um, various finance ministers have commented upon from time to time uh, around the, the concept, the idea of, particularly in the community planning partnership uh, arena, of uh, you know one payment being made. Uh, I think I can recall one finance minister saying that that would be the measure of success of community planning if one single cheque could be given to one single body for them to distribute according to the needs within that particular area. So I think these are the kind of issues that are being teased out in terms of the, the, the Murray response. John. Right. Thank you, convener. I'll move on to Mr Freeland. Mr Freeland, you said that South Lanarkshire uh, is potentially being punished because of the investment that took place in the school's estate over the past period. Uh, could you explain the cost pressures or the budgetary pressures in terms of that investment in the school estate and how much of that budgetary pressure at local authority level may be due to the funding schemes uh, that were devised for the uh, building of new schools in South Lanarkshire and whether or not that has any pressure. And I'm really referring to the PFI PPP uh, initiatives that a number of local authorities in Scotland undertook uh, since the 2003, I believe it was, uh, and whether or not that is causing additional budgetary pressure on the local authority meeting the costs from servicing the debts accrued. Mr Freeland. Thank you. I don't think I said we were punished. Um, I think we were disadvantaged, I think, in terms of had we waited um, to do our skills programme, we probably had additional funding opportunities, which we didn't have because we, we took the decision earlier um, than other local authorities to improve the schools. In terms of the PFI, we did our secondary schools through PFI, so I think that costs, I think it's roughly £20 million pounds per annum we fund um, for the PFI um, schools. All our primary school estates we did from prudential borrowing, we didn't use PFI. Um, on that, I think it's an additional, we've put an additional three million pounds worth of borrowing over the last two or three years, a total, I think, of about 39 to 40 million pounds worth of additional revenue costs per annum to, per, um, to fund our schools. We get funding back from that from the Scottish Government. That's a gross figure. We, we get some of that back from, Scot from the Scottish Government. How much that 20 million you referred to in terms of high school uh, servicing the debt, how much is that as a percentage of your overall education budget? Um, Total budget is 750 in the education budget. I need, I need to get the exact figure, but I can get you that. I appreciate that. Uh, moving on, convener, just sorry, the scattered sure. approach here in terms yeah. of the, trying to deal with some of the issues. Uh, certainly, I would welcome any other 
uh, local authority to comment or even Councillor Cairns comment in terms of the budgetary pressures and local authorities if they participated in the PFI PPP project because I'm aware that some of these costs in South Lanarkshire's case £20 million pounds servicing costs could apply to other authorities uh, throughout Scotland. Sir Keenan, I know that this was a major issue when I was in the resources and capacity group in COSLA. Is that still the case? Is there still a lot there? I mean, I, I'm not, not going back in the sort of PPP schools, but from a Dundee point of view, I mean, our, direct, well, our chief executive, and, uh, who was the director of finance when that was going through, uh, says that Dundee got a particularly good deal that funded it through a bond, uh, so it might have done something different from others. And Dundee, obviously, like other areas, have continued to try to uh, build on its school estate and, and improve on its school estate. It obviously opens up uh, uh, an endless educational uh, uh, facility as it offers most of these schools offer a much more flexible uh, space within them for, for delivery of education. And we're trying to do what we can. Uh, you know, I, I suppose in terms of the, the funds that become available uh, to build new schools, no doubt we, like every other authority, would like to see a bit more. John. Thank you for that. Can I move on to Mr. Uh, Dunn. Mr. Dunn, you made reference in an earlier response about increasing the hourly rate to external providers of services for Edinburgh City Council. You mentioned, I think it was 1450-odds to 1550, uh, or figures round about that. Uh, in relation to contracting external providers, why is it do you feel Edinburgh City Council needs external delivery agents rather than delivering those services from within uh, Edinburgh City Council? Is the, is the cost-benefit analysis been done in terms of savings to the council? Yeah. I could get in for the details to you, but what Edinburgh does is it's a kind of we do have an internal supply ourselves of staff who do it, and we do have an external supply of staff, and it's a kind of mixed market we do. And we do that both in our residential homes and things like home care. I could get further details as to, we've done testing as to the right mix of the market between internal and external markets. There's costs when you do your staff internally, you do have things like superannuation and other costs, etc. But what I could do, there has been papers that in the past, and I'd be happy to pass that to the committee for their consideration, but it's a mixed market we do across the home care and the um, residential care market in Edinburgh. Grateful for the documents. But one of the main concerns that comes from the unions, particularly Unison, is the no amount of outsourcing that local authorities are now engaged in or transferring uh, staff, directly employed staff from local authorities to arm's length companies. Uh, in relation to the, the question, because what we get is a global figure produced saying how many employees are employed by local authorities in Scotland. And I think the last time we saw those figures, there was a figure of roughly three to 5,000 staff lost uh, to local authorities. Uh, however, a number of those staff figures are, have, have been people who have been transferred to arm's length organisations. Would anyone like to comment on the benefits of the transfer to arm's length organisations and the cost savings that are being made? By those transfers. He wants to have a crack at that first, then. Mr. Freeland. I think, I mean, we, we, we operate a leisure trust, that's the only arm's length company we have, and basically it's just down to the, the rates relief we get from it. So that, funds, that helps fund the service. So it's just purely a taxation issue. Mr. Freeland, can I ask you about the home care projects yep. in South Lanarkshire? Because a number of years ago, uh, South Lanarkshire were named and effectively shamed in terms of the, the home care. Uh, service delivery by an external delivery agent. Uh, has that issue been resolved uh, and were the savings that were made justifiable in terms of the care that was being provided to particularly housebound and elderly? Uh, they weren't actually savings. I mean, they were, they were part of the cost of providing the service where we provide part of the service in-house and part of the service we contract out. Um, so it wasn't a, a deliberate decision to say we will now move from an in-house service to an out-house service 
to a contracted service. It's always been a blend between an in-house provision and a contracted out service. Again, because in terms of the market, etc., dictates a lot of that in terms of how we can employ and how flexible um, the private sector can be at times to allow us to discharge some of our responsibilities. Um, I think, yes, it has got better. We've got much more awareness of the contractors that are working for us. The contractors have all got good care commission grades, etc., now as well, and that's one of the, um, I guess, qualifications or criteria we use when assessing uh, suitable contractors. They must have a good care commission grade. So I think that has moved on since that, that, since that time. We still have a proportion of in-house versus um, contracted services. And again, as the financial squeeze goes upon us, one of the options for us in terms of savings is to to change that proportion. I mean, if, if we did change the proportion from in-house to um, contracted services, and that's not an arm's length country, it's a company, it's just, it's just contracting that service out, we would save money. So far, we've re we, the Council has resisted doing that. Thanks, sir, Keenan. I think you wanted to come in and arm length. I suppose the, you know, there has been a number of people that have left the business just based on the fact that we've made redundancy packages available and we've downsized on that. People that we, we have a leisure trust as well, and again, that's based on rates and taxation. We also have Tayside contracts where we've moved some people to Tayside contracts because there's been a cost benefit in doing that. Uh, any monies that are made in Tayside contracts, because it's a joint venture company between uh, uh, Dundee, Perth, and Angus councils, and any cost benefit and profit that's made out of that is distributed back into these councils by the proportion of business that they put in this direction. John. Just to, to, for clarification, when we get the global figures in terms of staff reductions in local government, then we can start trying to marry that up with other initiatives that are taking place, whether that be arm's length organisations or, in your case, Councillor Keenan, the Tayside Contracts organisation, where staff have been direct, direct transferred but are no longer accounted against uh, the staffing levels and the local authorities concerned. I mean, I, I'm, I'm unsure of the global figures that there is. I know that people uh, politically like to quote these, but it's not something I've ever looked into myself, so I wouldn't be able to quote them in any way. Have any of the officers got anything to say on that front? No. Mr. For Mr. Burns? For completeness, um, Murray has won uh, Leisure Trust. It was more to do with capital consents at the time, and that was the way to construct the centre, but clearly there's, there's the taxation benefits as well. No further questions. Thank you. Okay. Stuart McMillan, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, panel. Um, so the first question is, is regarding the uh, ring fencing in the Edinburgh submission uh, in point 4i. Um, it highlights the, the issue of, uh, of the, re the reduction in ring fencing. I'm just... Uh, I uh, wonder if the, if the other panellists actually agree with the comments from Edinburgh City Council. Uh, Mr Dunn, do you want to go first since it's from your submission? Yeah, the, the actual submission sets out that the therefore of link fencing that used to be apparent in the local government settlement over the years has reduced. Um, so that is something that local government welcome and that the money it comes to us, we have um, local pro local um, decisions to make as to where we spend that money rather than being directed to particular spending areas. So that's something that we have welcomed as an uh, um, initiative that's happened in the last few years. Thank you, Mr Burns. I think the position would, would, would be the same. I, I think it allows greater flexibility, particularly if as many authorities have had to do, integrate services and find different ways of working. Thank you, Mr Freeland. Yeah, absolutely. I think local authorities do welcome the flexibility and would try to have more flexibility if possible. I mean, the only thing just now, I think one of the major issues for us is teacher numbers and the lack of flexibility around teacher numbers. Councillor Keenan. I think that's uh, where cause they see it. Obviously, the removal of the, the sort of global ring fence was uh, an element of flexibility. There's very much a, a lot of the issues within there that people would wish to deliver anyway. Uh, obviously, the other aspect that we've got is based on here's your finance and, uh, and here's your constraints. These are the numbers that you need to produce. It uh, causes an element of difficulty as well. We'd probably like to go to more outcomes. Ms Bibby, is there anything else you wish to add for, from COSLA? Uh, Mr McMillan. Thank you for that. Um, uh, certainly also in Edinburgh City Council's um, submission, uh, it's under point 15. Um, you, you highlight uh, the situation regarding the, the, uh, the overestimation of the population growth, also based upon the, the census figures. 
uh, and as a consequence, uh, there has been a, there's going to be a reduction in funding uh, to the council. Uh, now, <clears throat> do you think that's actually uh, uh, do you think that's actually the, the, the right thing to do? Now, obviously, you're going to you're probably going to want to say that uh, yeah, you'd rather keep the money as compared to actually give the money back. Uh, but in terms of the in terms of that actual funding mechanism that's there, uh, do you think that's actually a fair thing to do? Mr. Dunn, uh, this comes back to basically the 85 per capita. Um, Edinburgh now gets a minimum of 85 per capita of Scotland's um, distribution, and we gained from that. And what happened in the census information came out that the growth in Edinburgh's population wasn't as steep as we expected. Uh, um, so, although it's going increasing, it wasn't increasing just at the rate of expected. So, part of that was that we received less funding. So, that's within the rules, and that's just why when the, the flat cap got revisited, we lost money from that. So I think we understood the reasons for that. I imagine that, uh, that there may well be uh, other local authorities uh, who might actually have the converse situation, uh, who will have uh, maybe the, the population figures may well have been uh, underestimated. So they've probably, uh, well, possibly lost out money. Yes, yeah, so there'd be one that's again, but it hit us more because the 85 rule comes in at the very end of the settlement calculation and there's not any kind of ba balances there or ceilings on how much you lose and basically the 85 benefits Aberdeen or Edinburgh so it's quite sharp the way that worked at the end of the settlement so we probably lost in percentage terms more than anybody else. Okay, thank you. Uh, in terms of the other panellists, I, mean, I, I didn't see uh, anything of that nature in your submissions. Uh, well, uh, maybe <coughs> the question that should be asked is do you think that funding should follow people? It's uh, a simple one, I would say. I'm, get, I'm seeing nods of the heads from everyone. Yes. Uh, Mr McMillan. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the, kind of the final question is actually to, it was in the Murray submission, um, where there was a situation regarding the, you know, to, <coughs> regarding the non-domestic rates uh, recovery. Um, you suggested uh, that uh, an improvement uh, could, be, uh, could be introduced there. Uh, so, in, in terms of actually having to wait six months before any recovery uh, could be taken forward, can you m m elaborate a bit more on your, uh, on your submission, please? Mr Burns? I, I, think, I think it's just the, the consistency between um, two ways of collecting tax, um, and I think the general presumption that the longer it takes to collect a tax, the less easy it is to collect, and therefore, if there were an earlier point of intervention, uh, given the success rates uh, for other forms of local taxation, then the hope would be there would be a similar success rate in terms of non-domestic rates. Okay. Now, I see Mr Dunn uh, kind of, uh, nodding his head in approval. My understanding is that non-domestic rates companies can pay at the half point of the year, pay the whole instalment there. And I think what Murray's alluding to is that there might not be any tax collection in the first five months, and by that time, circumstances might have changed, making it more difficult to get rates into the organisation. So I think that's what the money submission was alluding yes. to. Okay. Mr Freeland, do you have any comments to add? No, just to share that thing, I think in terms of um, circumstances can change over six, a six month period and therefore you almost post um, any decision. So if, you, if you're allowed to be proactive during that first five, six months, you might actually collect more cash. Hmm. Uh, have any of your uh, local authorities actually made representations to the Scottish Government on that particular point? No. no. Okay. Uh, okay. Professor Kieran? I don't think I've got anything to add to that. That's these guys' day job, it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank okay, you. thank you. Alec Rowley, please. I think just going back to John Wilson's question around health and social care and the, 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 the balance, the mix between in-house provision, third sector and private sector, it would be useful if COSLA has that information if they could pass it to the committee for all 32 local authorities, because I know there's a mixed bag out there um, in terms of looking at this and a number of other issues. Could I perhaps pick up on the teacher-pupil ratio and the fact that this has been a condition of funding that leaders of councils have had to sign up to? Um, could I ask what COSLA's position on, on teacher-pupil ratio is and where authorities uh, are hoping that we will be with that in this current financial settlement? Councillor Keenan, please. I, I mean, I think it's uh, uh, something that we're looking towards 
negotiating with government to see if we can bring around the change based on more outcomes rather than the, the sort of teacher numbers. So it's an ongoing conversation that we're having. Uh, I suppose it's the position that we've agreed because of the settlement that we've taken, uh, but clearly there is a, a wish to move uh, to something different, a different type of model that would allow more flexibility. Do you want to could, add? Can anything? I just say that, well, for the information that you asked for, uh, we will attempt to give you whatever cause there's got available. We'd be grateful for that, Mr. Rowley. Well, on the teacher pupil ratio, I think it would be useful for the committee to understand more what local government are actually saying about that. Um, in terms of, often in this place you can get politics uh, being played around teacher numbers, but out there in local authorities there seems to be a real, a real concern that to continue to have to maintain this, this teacher pupil ratio is not necessarily the best way forward given the massive financial strain you're under. So I, I think it would be good if we can get a bit more understanding of how local authorities are, see this and view this. We were sort of collection of data, uh, then that, that information would become more available. It's the sort of feeling of councils at the moment that, uh, uh, the, the, you know, moving forward and having the teacher numbers will be difficult to maintain. Uh, there, there's obviously the flexibility. Some uh, people would be looking at the flexibility of school closures and mergers that would reduce the overall teacher numbers that we have. And, and I think that... Uh, you know, the, the work's ongoing towards coming to some kind of set, uh, agreement with government as to whether outcomes would be better, uh, because really we're looking at how much of the education attainment that somebody got going out the other end or, or going through school uh, being a much better than the, the, the hard and fast teacher numbers being the, being the issue for COSLA. I wonder, convener, if any the chief executives would like to add anything to that in terms of their own authorities and the view of the teacher-pupil ratio any of the officers wish to comment on pupil-teacher ratios? Mr Freeland. I think it's, it's just, again, a plea for flexibility. I mean, budgets are very tight, and we believe that that's one area where we could make um, some change without impacting on the outcomes for pupils. And, I think, and we are restricted just now. I think in terms of our financial planning, we've assumed no change. But it would be helpful if we had some um, direction in relation to if there was going to be change, then we had the flexibility to do that. I think it would impact upon our financial position in a positive way without negatively impacting on the outcomes for children. Do Mr Burns or Mr Dunn have anything there? No. Mr Wilson, with a small supplementary, please, yeah, Mr Burns. Uh, just on that issue about the teacher-pupil ratios, one of the headlines that's coming out, been coming out recently from local authorities is the issue about reducing the school hours. Uh, would any of the uh, panel want to comment on that? Because that, in terms of cost savings, is that something that's now being considered widely within COSLA uh, by local authorities to reduce the contact time with pupils as a cost-saving exercise in terms of uh, teachers? It's been discussed at COSLA, but obviously each individual local authority as it goes through its budget process need to start looking at how do they uh, make the figures match uh, the demand that they have. Uh, and I suppose that's the, the uh, only reason that we're seeing the like of that being floated somewhere as a, as a potential idea. Uh, it, so it's no COSLA position. Thank you. Do any of the officers have anything to add there? No. Mr Rowley, please. But we are, I'm assuming for that, that authorities, I mean, I know authorities are, are certainly arguing that this, this condition should be removed, and therefore one would assume that, that, that this could lead to a reduction in teachers, um, and that's where this, this political um, game, as it were, um, creates headlines and creates figures, and I just think there has to be some kind of transparency around the discussion of that, but... Of, uh, in some areas, it's very difficult to get supply teachers, so uh, there's, there's a bit of an issue there. But I think the, the, the outcome that COSLA would be looking on would be uh, trying to deliver the, the, the best educational attainment we possibly can and seeing whether there's a, that level of flexibility. So it's, it's reasonably early doors in the conversation that we're having with government uh, as, to, as to getting them to release it. I understand that there's a, uh, there's a political will uh, and the, the teachers numbers suggest that you deliver the outcome. We're looking at ways to say that the outcome can be delivered differently. Okay. Can I, can I just pick up on a, a couple of other issues? And if we, if we look at the sort of idea sitting behind community planning um, and we look at the Christie 
Commission and the Christie report that was, was, was going to guide public services. And, and what that really emphasises is preventative measures and, and joined up thinking. Can I ask, in terms of setting local authority budgets, how much discussion is there with community planning partners and what kind of input do they have into the budget and how far down the road are we in terms of Christie or are we not? Councillor Keenan, do you want to go first? I mean, I'm, I'm a councillor in opposition, and if any of you have been in opposition and the administration didn't particularly share their budget with you, they tell me they're going to put it out earlier than I ever put it out as a, as a leader of a council, and because there's this, there's this going to be out for a, a period of consultation that mine was never, according to them. I think that uh, you know the, the sort of conversation about the Christie Commission's on, you know, on the radar. Uh, and I think that it's something that we need to happen. And, and if you look at the demographics that are, pre that are presented to us and how population will grow and they'll be older and need more care, then we've got to certainly look at ways to uh, introduce uh, at an early stage some kind of mechanism that stops people getting falling into ill health. I mean, I would like to see, personally, for a lot of community planning partnership, I would like to see more social prescribing. Uh, where doctors obviously use their sports facilities in local government uh, to make sure that people take a light exercise. I mean, we have coaches, uh, and I think that it would be good for that. It would reduce sort of blood pressure and heart disease and the like. And that's just uh, me as an overweight guy telling you. Uh, you know, so I, I just think there's a lot of sort of benefits in that, and I would like to see that. I'm sure that it would bring around some, but these are the sort of barriers and. Uh, we're working in partnership, I hope that we can achieve. Mr Freeland. I think in terms of the community planning agenda, most partners are setting their own budgets. I mean, statutorily, really they have to do that. I think what happens is that people are now working towards to try and establish what parts of those budgets we can join up better, what parts of those budgets we can actually pool resources and that kind of more pooling of budgets rather than integrating budgets. I mean, health and social care integration will change that in terms of that aspect of the business, if you like. But in relation to other parts of community planning, it's more about relationship management to try and work with partners to establish outcomes. And part of that at times involves um, sharing budgets rather than setting, and setting a specific budget jointly for a specific function. Mr Burns. Nothing to add to what Mr Freeland said. <clears throat> Mr Dunn, anything to add? No. Mr Rowley. Thank you. And Mick Taggart, please. Thanks, Convener. Um, and taking it a bit further, um, whereby my colleague Alec Rowley has asked about the consultation with CPPs. Can I ask what consultation there has been with local people and the service users about some of the reductions in the budgets and, and some of the services that may well be reduced. Councillor Keenan, do you want to go first? <coughs> I mean, I think that I think that we need to have that level of conversation uh, and dialogue. It's not happening in Dundee, but I noticed that Edinburgh, uh, when I was through here a few weeks ago, had signs up saying, contact us, tell us what you think. And, and you know, I, th I think some of these things are, are good practice. Uh, I doubt if anybody ever wants to lose a service that they already receive, but uh, people know that money is tight and uh, you know there would be some reasonable suggestions that could be taken forward. Yeah, similarly we've got a consultation process where the Director of Finance and his team go out to roadshows, etc., trying to engage with people about the potential savings. We've got a citizens panel, etc., as well, and we put these uh, advice point of things to ask people about the services as well. So we try and consult as widely as we can on the savings before they go to committee. Mr Burns? Exactly the same as Mr Friedland, with the addition that for uh, younger people we also produced a, a game uh, where young people could move budgets around in terms of what they thought was priority. So we could take all the information from all the different uh, age groups in the roadshows and, and uh, make some sense of it. Mr Dunn? We alluded to Edinburgh this year's kind of what's called the Budget Planner, and so far we've had 1,300 people submitting how they would balance the budget. The challenge is to balance the budget over three years, so what we're asking people to do is look at how they would take £67 million out of the Council's budget over the next three years, and we're very happy with 1,300 people. We based it on Liverpool did it last year, similar size. They got 1,400 people. We're not competitive, but we're hopefully going to <laughs> <laughs> get some like 1,500. So that's a way of, a new way of getting engagement. And as you say, we'd put street light laps 
and we move them around the city at uh, intervals to kind of get people engaged. And from the information we're getting, we are aware that of the gender balance that's coming through. There's more males at the moment, so we're trying to proactively encourage more females to, to provide some feedback as well. And we're also getting age distributions of the people who are providing that information. And as we're getting the younger people, and now we're trying to make sure we get the balance right between different age groups. So this will all feed into the budget. And as well as doing the budget planner, we're getting comments back on the budget which is very helpful, and that will all go to the Finance and Associates Committee in January so that members have all this information before they make their decision on the budget in February. Ms McTaggart. Sounds an excellent best practice model there. Um, statutory, I think I was going to ask about statutory and non-statutory services, but I think we've kind of answered that. Sorry. Thanks, Kavina. Uh, Mr McMillan, then, I think, you the supplementary, uh, if you're yes, brief. It is, it's, uh, just in terms of uh, your comments, uh, Mr Dunn, um, have you noticed a, 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 a variation in the demographics uh, of people who are actually getting involved uh, with this consultation? We're beginning to see that information, and we're getting the ports on that, and it is a change before, which may be the kind of more older people who used to come to the budget meetings, etc. We're getting a younger draft out there, but what we're trying to do is make sure we get a broad range across both the age group and also between male and female. In terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, kind of areas of uh, more deprivation and the like, are you, is, there a, is, is there still a challenge there? there? We do have postcode information on that, and we're actually trying to take steps to make sure we get a balance across the whole Edinburgh, not just from certain neighbourhoods. OK, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, the president of COSLA uh, said at the last COSLA conference that the local government in Scotland uh, was getting a much better deal um, than local authorities south of the border. Um, do you uh, agree with that statement? Um, and do you think that, that COSLA has done well in terms of negotiating for local government in terms of budget settlement? Councillor Keenan. That's a, that's a good question. I just wonder if David had his arm twisted up his back <laughs> when he said it. But I mean, I think there's really difficult times, and I suppose Cosla accept that there is difficult times. So, uh, you know, and, and whilst the majority of our members obviously probably consider we've got a reasonable deal, there is an element of uh, doubt there as to whether we have. So, if that leaves you with the sitting on the fence uh, approach, then I'll, I'll probably prefer to stick to that. Well, as you were a Liberal Democrat, uh, <laughs> King Sir Keenan. Uh, uh, no, that's, a, that's a bad one. Uh, Mr Freeland. Uh, I don't know about a comparison with England. I can just tell you what it feels like in um, South Lanarkshire. It feels hard and it's getting harder. Uh, Mr Burns. I wouldn't disagree with Mr Freeland. OK. Mr Dunn. I think it's been summed up. OK. Um, can I thank you all very much for your evidence today? Um, you promised various things in writing. Uh, I'm going to want to be really bad here, but we've got a very short timescale um, for the report. Could we possibly have that before the end of this week? Um, I, I, again, thank you. Um, I suspend this meeting uh, for a change in witnesses and a comfort break. Thank you.
Uh, we now move on to our second panel of witnesses. Uh, I'd like to welcome Deputy First Minister of Scotland and the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and the Economy, John Swinney, MSP, and congratulations on your new role, DFM, uh, and Robin Haynes, Local Government Division, and Bill Stitt, Local Government Finance Division of the Scottish Government. Uh, would you like to make any opening statement, Deputy First Minister? Thank you, Convener, and um, I warmly appreciate your good wishes uh, this morning. It's a pleasure once again to be uh, in front of the committee to look at the 2015-16 draft budget, um, which, uh, as the committee has indicated, will focus in particular on the draft local government France circular. Um, the circular in question that the committee has raised is, is one dated the 7th of July, which provides a a representation of a snapshot in time. Of course, the government will publish on the 11th of December the 2015-16 draft local government settlement, um, which will be the start of the statutory consultation on the new circular, which will be um, uh, applied to local government. Uh, the committee will know that the government has worked hard with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities to provide fair settlements to Scottish local authorities given the reductions that have been faced by the Scottish Government in our budget as a consequence of the United Kingdom's austerity programme. The Scottish budget is roughly divided into three parts, with health and local government sharing about two-thirds of that total budget. With the health budget having received a real terms increase in each and every year as set out in our manifesto, uh, some very difficult decisions have had to be taken to maintain local government funding. Because of those difficult decisions we have taken, local government has been treated fairly under this government. The local government finance settlements have been, has, has been maintained across the period 2012 to 2016 on a like-with-like -like basis, with extra money being applied for new duties that have been allocated and agreed with local government. This has resulted in a total settlement of over £10.6 billion in 2014-15, set to increase to almost £10.8 billion in 2015-16. Um, I believe this settlement has enabled local authorities to effectively deliver frontline services. The distribution of this considerable sum of money is clearly vital for individual local authorities, and that is why the distribution formula is kept under constant review both at official and political levels with COSLA. Following the most recent review in 2009, the consensus was that the existing indicators used in the formula were considered to be reasonable and generally a fair reflection of need amongst local authorities. Um, the government's preference, uh, and we share this with COSLA, is to have a fair and equitable so, uh, settlement across all local authorities. On the question of non-domestic rates, we now allow councils to retain the income generated within their own boundaries. Although the Scottish Government still guarantees each council's formula share of the funding by making up any shortfall in business rates income, we now incentivise local authorities by allowing them to share any additional income generated through increased buoyancy or other factors. The original business rates incentivisation scheme was too blunt, so we've worked together with our local government partners to better focus this scheme on promoting and rewarding growth, and I hope to announce further details to Parliament on the 11th of December. Uh, uh, local government and the Scottish Government work um, collectively together to meet the financial uh, and social challenges that, uh, uh, that, that, that the people of Scotland face. Uh, one of the priorities for the Scottish Government has been to maintain a freeze in the council tax um, now for in, in its eighth successive year, um, providing further continued respite to all taxpayers the length and breadth of Scotland at a time of financial constraint. Um, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you very much, Deputy First Minister. Um, there has been some debate this morning round about the distribution formula. Um, can I ask what difference you think that the 85% floor um, has made uh, in dealing with those local authorities uh, that feel that the distribution formula um, uh, wasn't quite so good for them? Uh, one of the priorities that we uh, um, had in mind when we looked at the issue of an 85% flow, which, as, as you well know, Kavina, was a, a point advanced uh, vigorously by our late colleague Brian Adam, um, particularly in relation to the circumstances in Aberdeen, is that as the distribution formula was applied, the, the ongoing distribution formula, um, there were, in the case of um, a couple of authorities, some really very significant gaps beginning to emerge between, well, not beginning to emerge, they've been there for a long time, actually, to be honest, um, between um, a couple of outlier authorities um, whose funding was um, essentially not growing as strongly as 
the general trend uh, within local authorities in Scotland. So we, we were persuaded that that gap had, had to be addressed and the government put in place the 85% formula in the spending review in 2011 um, to essentially rectify that point. And in the course of um, the spending review, the beneficiaries from that formula have been the City of Aberdeen and the City of Edinburgh Councils, who of course have um, received uh, greater resources than they would have um, anticipated uh, with the application of the distribution formula. Um, we also touched upon the fact that um, some authorities uh, were worried uh, about the settlement uh, last year in terms of changes because of population change, etc. Um, the panellists earlier um, all stated that they felt that um, the finance should follow people. Um, is that something that you would uh, agree with, Deputy First Minister? I, I would, Karina, and, and, and population indicators in a whole variety of different areas underpin the composition of the distribution formula. So, for example, you know, well, in some indicators, um, quite simply, the number of people, residents, council taxpayers will be a principal driver in some of the indicators. In other indicators, uh, it will be the number of school pupils, for example, that will drive indicators, or the number of older people that will drive indicators. Um, and that complex picture of indicators is applied to the global sum of what will be £10.8 billion in 1516 uh, to determine what is the appropriate allocation local authority by local authority area. I think those the, the, the individual characteristics of the population indicators, now particularly a light on school pupils, for example, is very material to the process because of the impact that uh, school pupil numbers can have on you know, requirements for a number of teachers, the school estate, and various other factors that, that go with it. And there are, of course, authorities that today are wrestling with falling school numbers and other authorities that are wrestling with sharply rising school numbers and I think it's a pretty fair in indicator to deploy given the fact that authorities will be experiencing different circumstances in relation to the composition of their population and as a consequence of that the demand for public services that that follows um, such uh, such patterns. We also touched upon some of the pressures, health and social care integration, uh, Westminster's welfare reform agenda and the impact that that is having um, on uh, local authorities. Um, and of course, uh, we touched upon uh, the sharing of budgets. Do you think that um, the community empowerment legislation as it applies to community planning partnerships uh, will help in that sharing of budgets uh, and may lead to uh, a much better direction of uh, resources to deal with some of these cost pressures? The approach to health and social care integration, in my view, is, is, is utterly critical to how we proceed to ensure that individuals obtain and receive the support that they require, and these individuals will generally be some of the most fragile and vulnerable individuals within our society, and how we establish sustainability in our public finances and our public services. So I don't in any way understate the significance of health and social care integration. I view it as the key reform that will ensure that vulnerable individuals obtain the support to which they are properly entitled, and also that the public finances are um, and, and public services are made sustainable as a consequence. In my experience, um, members of the, the public and you know, perhaps in, in many circumstances also their families cannot understand and have no interest in understanding the debate that goes on between public authorities about who's paying for who. Um, if there's a vulnerable individual in our society, they require support. And it, it is the perspective of the individual and their family is that that person should obtain that support, and I agree wholeheartedly with uh, with that point. I think it becomes quite frustrating, and I'm sure members will have had this experience in their own caseload, as I have had in my caseload, where um, 
that there is a bit of a debate going on between public authorities about which actually consumes resources of itself. Valuable resources that could be deployed on caring for vulnerable individuals is spent on a you know, game of ping pong about who's actually going to pay for the care when it's patently obvious the individual needs that support. Adult health and social care integration, in my view, must lance that and lance it f ferociously because people in Scotland require the support that must be given to them from the public services and they're not interested in whether it comes from organisation A or organisation B. They're interested in whether they get it and get it in a timely fashion. Now, this is relevant very much to your wider point, convener, about the role of community planning partnerships because community planning partnerships have been um, established and they'll be established in statute by um, the Community Empowerment Bill. The, and, and we look to community planning partnerships to break down these barriers and boundaries and silos, call them whatever you wish to call them, convener, to make sure that we have a much more integrated and focused approach to the delivery of public services. And that is crucial to ensuring that we, um, we guarantee that the resources we have at our disposal can have the maximum impact and also that um, individuals are able to secure um, the, the necessary support that they require. Community planning partnerships also have a crucial role to deliver the wider public service reform agenda, one of the principal pillars of which in this debate is about prevention. Because if we can line up effectively our public services in a preventative mode, then the necessity for some of these very fraught discussions about who is providing the support and the care for an individual in a moment of crisis can be averted because we manage and act in a fashion that we can avert as much of that crisis as we possibly can do. Thank you. Uh, final, one, one final point I should add. Convener, you asked also about welfare reform, and I would be the first to, to accept that the United Kingdom government's welfare reform proposals are, be, uh, are having an effect on increasing the caseload and the demand that's faced by local authorities. And, of course, local authorities are partnering with the government in a number of different ways to address that, whether that's through the work on discretionary housing payments on, um, in relation to the bedroom tax, or whether that is in relation to uh, the council tax reduction scheme, where, of course, we are partnering with local authorities to make sure that we aren't in any way um, eroding the, um, the support that's available to people who will be financially challenged at this time. Thank you. Alec Crowley, please. Government Secretary, and I would also add my congratulations. Um, could I ask, firstly, about the um, teacher-pupil ratio. I was asking the, the panel previously. Um, the local authorities, um, I think, have um, been, been asking for some time that you look again at that and that it's not a condition that's put into the finance settlement. I just wonder where you think that's at and what your views are on it. As Mr Riley will be familiar, the, the, the agreement that we've reached with local government um, since 2011 has been to maintain the pupil-teacher ratio in local authority school um, at the 2011 level, which is about 13.5, and it's broadly been there consistently over that period. Uh, what we have agreed with local government in relation to this uh, settlement is to explore um, whether there is um, a more appropriate way of trying to um, manage our educational resources um, to take into account the, the necessity which we all accept to improve educational outcomes and whether there is a, a more appropriate way in which that can be considered. Now that work is, has been commissioned by um, the agreement that was reached with local government uh, over the summer in advance of the announcement of the budget and it has a pretty tight timescale, if my recollection is correct, uh, I think it is due to com complete before the end of the financial this financial year. Uh, so we should have that to hand before the start of the next financial year. OK, thank you. In terms of council tax and the council tax freeze, um, this committee 
um, put forward in its report looking at local government that there needed to be a sustainable long-term solution to how local government is financed. And I know I heard on the radio this morning that there may be um, that may be something that's, that's, that's um, comes forward later today for the for the first minister. So I wouldn't want to try and preempt that. But one of the things that we no, 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 neither <coughs> would I, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things one of the things that we did say is that given given the sort of politics around council tax and um, local income tax and whatever, that it would be desirable for for local government's point of view if we could get um, cross party. Uh, agreement and, and, and cross-party work on looking at what the alternatives are in terms of local government finance. And that's really the question I would like to ask you. Is it, are you committed to, to seeing um, across this, this parliament parties working together to try and find a solution? Because I think local authorities are desperate for a solution um, without all the politics that are likely to go with that. Um, the, um the committee will appreciate that I'm restricted in what I can say. Um, when you're the Deputy First Minister, you've really got to watch what you say in connection with the First Minister's words in Parliament. But uh, uh, let me just say that I think that the, the, government has, um, the government has a manifesto commitment to consult with others on how we might reform local taxation. And um, I gave a commitment in Parliament, I think, just... Uh, last week or perhaps the week before that we would be embarking on that shortly. Um, so there will be material in the programme for government on this question. Uh, we've listened very carefully to the proposition put forward by this committee, which I think is a, uh, is a welcome and thoughtful contribution to the debate. And uh, I would hope that um, uh, the committee would uh, be cheered by what the government has to say this afternoon. And can, can I pick up on the, um, what you said there about health and social care integration and Christie and the, the prevention first and there was some chief executives in earlier and, and, and I was asking them in terms of budget setting um, where the community partnership comes into that and how, how our partners consult on each other and I wasn't convinced that, that the answer suggested that there is a lot of detailed consultation there. So how do we move this forward, um, given, given the, the, the massive pressures, regardless of the, the current economic situation, given, given the massive pressures that are coming on services, how are you actually um, trying to measure to see if, if we are getting better integration and, and, and if community planning is actually working? In terms of the process of going about that, um, the government's done a number of things to try to bring about this change in uh, in, in focus so that we have um, much more a much more joined up approach to the deployment of individual budgets at local level. Um, local authorities are, as Mr Rowley will well know, um, independent uh, entities. They cannot be directed by ministers. I cannot uh, I may have liked to have t told the former leader of Fife Council how to spend his budget, but he would have vigorously resisted um, my direction in that respect. But so what we've tried to do is to encourage um, a climate of open discussion around the setting of budgets between principal, between major public authorities at local level. So if I go back to 2011, um, or perhaps it was 2012, um, along with the President of COSLA and the Health Secretary, um, I authored a letter to all local authority uh, leaders and chief executives, to all health board chief executives, to, um, at that time, uh, chief constables and other police um, uh, uh, and other leading public authorities, to encourage them in the context of community planning to essentially have an open discussion within community planning partnerships about shared budget priorities. That didn't erode anybody's independence of operation, but it did recognise the fact that how a local authority makes its decisions about public expenditure will have an effect on how the health service deploys its resources and vice versa. Um, so whilst recognising and respecting the independent democratic character of local government, we have tried to bring as much cohesion and synergy 
to the setting of shared priorities at local level as we possibly could do. Um, we have so that's the that's the process to try to encourage that that, that approach. Um, we've reinforced it by um, inviting the Accounts Commission to undertake reviews over the effectiveness of community planning partnerships, and they've carried out a number of those reviews to assess whether or not the frankly, the rhetoric of the government is actually translating into good operational practice at local level. I think it would be fair to say that, that was, there was some encouragement in amongst all of that, but also still some challenge of what had to be achieved into the bargain. And um, that the, the National Community Planning Group is essentially, which brings together ministers, leading uh, local authority figures, uh, leading health board figures, police, fire, our enterprise companies, the skills network, a variety of other public bodies to monitor and to maximise the progress that we're making so that we are able to actually see on the ground much greater evidence of budget sharing and complementarity between the budgets of different public bodies. Um, and that uh, and that's the that's the model that we utilise. And obviously, um, is it perfect? I wouldn't for I wouldn't for a moment try to suggest it is, but I do believe that good more more good integrated working is now happening than was the case before. And just my final yes, point on Mr. that would, would be really back to the health and social care. And I think previously I was one of the few council leaders that was actually. Um, of the view that, that bringing together integrated health and social care would have been better with a direct resource rather than going into the two separate authorities to then pull together. Um, and, and I still, I still am of that view. But given that you were saying that the government um, has protected health and then local government next, it's difficult to see how much of that goes into acute, how much it goes into community, how it's fall on demand, and, and what that relationship is with local government. I think the the argument that Mr. Riley makes is, a, is, a, is an entirely valid argument about what is the possible channel of resources going into the health and social care partnerships. The government took the view that you know if, if you know the government is. is as, I, as I, I think Mr. Rowley appreciates, um, the government has um, has generally taken an approach which has been designed to um, to build cooperation and consent with local government. Local government is a you know, it's a distinctive; de it has its own democratic mandate. Um, the government has uh, tried to avoid um, dictating and directing. We have tried to establish cooperation and collaboration with local government and uh, generally we've had a pretty receptive um, hearing from local government but there will be issues where local government doesn't agree with us and in those circumstances that, you know, I think you know, the government tries to avoid there's certain circumstances we have to press ahead with our priorities but we try to avoid that we try to do everything by consent so if we don't have local authority leaders with us on the, in the fashion that we may have had Mr Rowley we, we generally respect that and, uh, and, and, and deal with that. I think the, the questions that Mr Riley raises about the balance between acute care and primary care and social care, the, the, these are the meat and drink of the sustainability of public services because we all know it is disproportionately, it costs disproportionately more to support an individual in an acute hospital than it does to support somebody in their own home probably about 10 times the amount. And as finance minister, I can see the merits of an option which costs one-tenth of, of the money. If the person gets the care they require in their own home and it costs us one-tenth of what it would cost us to keep them in an acute hospital, then I think that's desirable. Now, the only way we will get to that point is if we have effective, really effective, joined-up decision-making about health and social care activity. Because... If we can avoid, some people need to go into acute hospitals, of course they do, but some people don't. Many people don't, actually, and the data speaks for itself. And the more we can ensure that the support mechanisms are in place to support individuals in their own homes, the better. Thank you. Obviously, the... Um, Funding formula is our responsibility of course.
cause light in terms of its application, but um, although this is a point often lost on certain finance conveners who tend to lay their woes at the door squarely of the Scottish Government in terms of their own individual settlements, but um, the, the point was made by Lindsay Freeland of South Lanarkshire Council earlier that he felt that um, essentially the funding formula disadvantages progress on certain indicators because there would be a consequential knock-on effect um, to the funding that is received. Is that a concern that, that, that you would share in terms of how the funding formula applies, that essentially it rewards those councils which don't make progress on some of the key indicators around, for example, deprivation? There, there, there can be um, consequences of that type in the application of the funding formula. Um, you know, the, the, the allocations that are made are driven by a range of indicators. Um, and there could be a scenario, you also hear this argument put forward around about um, um, some of the issues around the school estate, um, where different conclusions could be arrived at given um, you know, to try to avoid a negative outcome through indicators. I think that's something we have to be very mindful of. I think there's counterbalanced by the fact that, as I explained earlier on, uh, to, uh, in response to Mr Rowley's question, the, the government has a shared focus with local government on making progress around a number of key factors and indicators um, which will comprise the national performance framework. And, uh, you know, I, I really would struggle to see the justification for any local authority leader trying to focus more on the preservation of budget elements or budget indicators than on actually deliver some, delivering some of the improvements that are necessarily and required within our society as driven by our shared focus on the national performance framework. I, w I wonder with that, I mean, do, do you do you take the view, I mean, I know, as I say, it's, uh, the, the, the formula is driven through COSLA, but do you take a view that perhaps there needs to be more of a focus on delivery of outcomes as part of the way funding is distributed, given that that is the, the narrative that we're trying to drive at a national level? That would be the logical conclusion. That would be the logical extension of the national performance framework, and it's certainly an area that I'm, I would be prepared to explore. That um, where we actually drive funding much more by the achievement of a greater performance and success as a consequence of our activities. Mm. But you'd have to ensure that that was properly um, structured to take due account of the fact that there are a whole range of different um, areas upon which we are keen to make progress. You know, the National Performance Framework is a balanced approach across a range of different policy indicators, so we would have to have a range of, uh, of, of priorities in mind in undertaking such an assessment. Mm. Well, one of the other points that came up during the previous session, again from South Lanarkshire, was that they um, uh, identified that they're paying out £20 million per annum to service PFI debt on educational buildings. What figures does the Scottish Government hold around the sort of cumulative PFI payments that local authorities are having to made and having to make on a on an annual basis, and how does that bear down on some of the cost pressures that are being faced within the the current financial climate? I don't have in front of me a cumulative figure for local authority um, PFI payments, but um, I think it is important to recall that. PFI payments by local authorities will be one of the first calls on a local authority budget because of the contractual nature of those payments. So before a local authority thinks about doing anything else, it has to pay its PFI payments. If they are, you know, as we well, as we know, um, substantial factors within local authority budgets, then that will intensify cost pressures for um, for individual authorities. Uh, clearly, local authorities have to make judgments on these points based on um, a prudential approach to the management of their finances, and uh, they, they should only enter into such commitments if they have the confidence to, to be able to support those particular commitments. Get that number before the end of the week, Deputy First Minister. We, we'll uh, we'll endeavour to get that to you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, just finally, convener. One of the other points that was raised, a point that I put to the the, the first panel, was around um, the the 
the consequential impact on revenue budgets of capital expenditure and the possibility of, for example, looking at innovative means of, of financing. I know that the Scottish Government obviously is driving through MPD. One of the other means that some capital projects, I'm thinking particularly social housing, could potentially be delivered would be through utilisation of pension fund investment. Is that a conversation that you've had with um, pension funds, um, both local authority pension funds and other pension funds around ways that they could look at maybe uh, reallocating some of their investments to, to drive some of these capital projects that would then see a return to the pension funds? It's been one of my frustrations that local authority pension funds have been less involved in committing to support public sector infrastructure than I would have believed to be the case, that there should have been the case. Um, if, if, if one was to look at the, uh, a project, um, you know, I think of one particular example that's etched in my memory, uh, the M80 upgrade between Steps and Hags. Um, we went, that was a, it was, a, it was a PFI contract that we inherited from our predecessors, and because it was an advanced stage, I, I decided to continue with it. Um, in that format, um, it would have delayed it significantly if we hadn't done so. And I went to the market to try to obtain about £320 million worth of um, investment in October 2008. Um, it wasn't the greatest of time to go to the markets for investment, um, given all that was going on in the world. And we eventually pulled off that deal, but I would have thought that was the type of project that was ripe for local authority pension funds to support, because it was a main arterial route in Scotland. There is no way the government could have said, oh, well, we'll just put a few cones across this road. We'll not use it for a little while, you know, so we won't pay, need to pay the payments. It's an absolutely fundamental part of the infrastructure of Scotland, so the government would have to make repayments over the years for it. Totally secure, safe, totally robust long-term investment. No pension funds. So it's been, a, it's been something that's, in, that's frustrated me, that local authority pension funds have not seen there being a role for them to invest their resources in some of the long-term infrastructure projects. Now, I think that position's improving now, but it has been a frustration over the years. Anne McTaggart, please. Thanks, Convener. Um, good morning, Deputy First Minister. It's just really to recap and, and ask how the allocation to local government is compared to other portfolios over the previous spending review. Well, essentially, um, over the... Um, over the period since 2011-12, um, uh, the government has essentially um, taken forward what I would call, um, in the face of a declining overall Scottish government budget, uh, a stable approach to local authority funding. So if we, for example, um, if, if we recognise that the the health budget has had a particular degree of protection by the government, and we take that out of the equation. Um, local authority share of the remaining resources within the government's budget since 2011-12 has um, has well, since 2007-8, sorry, has gone up from 55.7 to 57.2, it will be 57.2 in 2015-16. That essentially gives a sense that in a, you know, when we take the health resources out of the equation, generally the local authority position has a, acquired a greater share of the, local, the remaining Scottish Government budget uh, than was the case when we came to office. And just a final, can I jump on to um, the funding method itself? Um, we had received evidence from Renfrewshire Council who have stated that the formula does not take into account the issues of deprivation enough. I think these are obviously matters of debate and consideration. I'm sure there will be in Renfrewshire Council a view that deprivation is not taken sufficiently into account in the formula and I, I'm quite sure in the island communities their view would be that you know the, the, the challenges of operating in islands are not taken into account enough in the formula. I think what we try to do 
uh, as I've explained in some of my earlier answers, is come to an agreement with local government about how best to do this. And in 2009, I asked local government what was the you know, what was the appetite for wider review, which would have allowed us to embark on some of the issues that uh, Ms McTaggart uh, fairly raises about um, the perspective of Renfrewshire Council. And the general view, or well, the view that I got back from local government, with the exception, I, I think, of uh, perhaps your good self, convener, uh, as re a representative of Aberdeen City Council, I think you were perhaps the lone voice in, 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 that, that, in that debate, convener, was that um, the local government was generally satisfied with the, but well, satisfied, felt that where we were on the distribution formula was the fairest place to be. Um, and, uh, but obviously the government, you know, if I follow through the logic of what I've been saying to the committee this morning about our attitude towards local government and how we relate to local government, we obviously are keen to make sure that we work in consort and in collaboration with local authority in addressing these issues. So if local government was to say to us, look, we want to re-explore the distribution formula, then the government would be uh, perfectly happy to consider that. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Uh, just because you're in the minority of one doesn't mean that you're wrong. Uh, Cameron Buchanan, please. Deputy <laughs> First Minister, congratulations. Thank you. Could I ask you to comment on no the issue of non-domestic rates and business rates? What do you intend to do about that, or what's your comment on it? Please. The, the, in my opening statement, Kavir, I, I said that we, we now pay non-domestic rates to, um, well, we allocate the non-domestic rates income raised in each local authority area directly to that local authority. Uh, so the local authority obtains its um, full benefit from, um, from the non-domestic rates income. Um, secondly, we have obviously taken a number of decisions on the level and the approach to business rates, particularly with the introduction in 2008-09 of the Small Business Bonus Scheme, which came in, which was implemented over a two-year period. And um, our plan would be to sustain and to continue the Small Business Bonus Scheme. We have, of course, taken other uh, decisions, some of them controversial, about non-domestic rates. The application of the public health supplement was applied. I said I would apply it for a three-year period. That period will come to a conclusion at the end of this financial year and that will be the end of the public health supplement, as I indicated would be the case. Um, and we've also um, fulfilled our manifesto commitment to ensure that the business poundage, business rates poundage in Scotland was maintained in parity with, with England. And of course, that's required us at certain stages to apply changes that responded to decisions the United Kingdom government uh, took, for example, to cap business rate increases at 2%, as they did last year. We followed through on those uh, those type of indicators. So that's a, um, a, 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 and then finally, um, the other point I would add is that the business rates incentivisation scheme was um, a government commitment. We took it forward. The, the way in which it was constructed did not take account of some of the volatility that we were experiencing in uh, the settlement and resolution of appeals under the valuation process. And we had to revisit that, and we've now done that with agreement of local authorities. And we should be in a position to announce the conclusions of that in, in, in the, with the local government circular in December. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stuart McMillan, please. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, Deputy First Minister, congratulations mm -hmm. on your appointment. Um, I just uh, asked uh, Murray Council uh, in the previous session regarding the uh, non-domestic rates uh, recovery because they actually had something in the submission, and they suggested that the the delay uh, the, the delay of uh, six months before they can actually attempt to recover um, any any monies any outstanding monies is uh, is too long a timescale, um, and. I further asked the, the three um, chief executives in terms of have they actually contacted the Scottish Government uh, on this particular point, uh, and uh, it turned out that actually they, they hadn't. Uh, but it's, uh, the whole issue of the six months delay, is that something that uh, the Scottish Government uh, are looking at to assist local authorities? We, we, we've not looked at um, a... We... Um, we have to an extent explored this in the 
2013 consultation on business rates, um, and that this wasn't this you know the, the recovery timetable was raised with us by uh, COSLA, and the government responded um, uh, saying that. Um, some there were issues that we were prepared to um, consider, uh, and I would certainly be very open to exploring some of these issues. Um, I have, you know, we, we are very clear that um, it is important that the resources that to which local authorities are entitled through proper charging for of bills, and um, they are entitled to see and entitled to see timiously. So if there are ways in which we can assist local authorities in trying to um, recover these sums, uh, we'd certainly uh, be happy to do so. I think on business rates, the one caveat I would put into this is obviously from time to time businesses will just have to be, you know, have to take care with their payments and issues and which can affect their sustainability. And providing there was enough um, discretion in the system so that sensible judgments could be applied to businesses that may be just facing a little bit of a delay in cash flow issues. Um, providing sufficient account was taken of that in the system, I would be pre very prepared to consider these issues. Okay, no, thank you. Um, certainly, um, in the earlier session, um, I, I posed a question regarding the, the census uh, figures. The Edinburgh City Council and their submission uh, had indicated that, uh, as a consequence uh, of the of the overestimated uh, population uh, for the, the city, um, then they received more money in, in the funding allocation. But then, after the 2011 census figures, uh, the, the growth wasn't as expected, so they were receiving uh, a reduction uh, in figures, uh, well, in, in the sum uh, going to them. Um, but uh, on the flip side of that, there may well be local authorities whose population growth has actually been underestimated and as a consequence they might be receiving a, a shortfall in monies. Um, what, uh, what actions would, uh, would the Scottish Government undertake to, to assist local authorities if any are in that particular position? This is a, it's quite a difficult issue, this one, because the, we do get a number of population estimates and as we know full well, they're not always accurate. You know, the population of Scotland was predicted to be heading well below 5 million. It's now sitting at 5.3 million. So there's one estimate that was way off um, on this question. And obviously, when you start drilling that down to individual local authorities, the room for error is very significant in, uh, in, in, in getting these things wrong. We use the most up-to-date information that we have available um, at any individual settlement. And then obviously new information comes to hand that gets revised over the course of time. Um, I think the, the, the whole management of this question really is a matter for, the financial management of the consequences is really a matter for individual local authorities. This is why local authorities um, are able to hold reserves, is one of the factors why they can hold reserves, so that they can take due account of the... Uh, changes in circumstances or volatilities that may emerge that they need to address as part of their activities. So we do use the best available information we can, but there may well be a necessity to revise that at different stages. Okay. Yeah, on that, the <coughs> very brief supplementary, um, Deputy First Minister, you've mentioned um, local authority reserves. Uh, obviously, a number of local authorities are running quite substantial levels of reserves at present. Do you and do the Scottish Government take a view on deployment of reserves and, and levels of reserves, particularly given that, you know, as we enter into the sort of austerity phase two, um, many local authorities probably should be looking at, at drawing down some of those reserves to prepare services for the worst that, that could be to come from, from Westminster austerity? There is a prudential judgment to be made by individual local authorities on the appropriate level of reserves to be undertaken. Um, um, the Accounts Commission will uh, have established guidance um, It'll either be through the Accounts Commission or Audit Scotland on the appropriate level of reserves that um, should be held. And um, 
obviously local authorities in some circumstances will hold reserves in excess of that because they're holding a reserve for a specific purpose um, and uh, they may also have reserves in uh, particular housing revenue accounts which have got particular purposes and constraints applied to them. So there will be um, a variety of circumstances why a local authority would perhaps hold reserves greater than um, the recommended level from the Accounts Commission. Uh, ultimately, this is a judgment for individual authorities, but of course some authorities will have used reserves to support some of their um, service transformation programmes to ensure greater sustainability in the long term. And of course that's a, a very sensible utilisation of reserves um, to be taken forward by local authorities. Alan, do you want to come back? Uh, no, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Deputy First Minister. And may I also congratulate you on your new role uh, and look forward to working with you as part of this committee in the future uh, in terms of scrutinising the budgets of local authorities. On the issue of local authority budgets, and to follow up that last question in terms of cash reserves held by local authorities, I'm aware that in the past... Uh, Deputy First Minister, you have uh, offered a facility to local authorities of additional borrowing consents in relation to meeting their equal pay and single status commitments. Could you outline uh, or give us an update in relation to how the equal pay and single status settlements are going and whether or not uh, there is any discussions regarding a, a further additional borrowing that may be required by local authorities to meet the latest round of commitments in relation to equal pay and single status? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not in receipt of any request from local authorities for um, further borrowing facilities. Obviously, th these borrowing facilities I'm only able to make available under the current arrangements with the consent of Her Majesty's Treasury. Um, if my memory serves me right, on any occasion I have gone to the Treasury to ask for such facilities, um, uh, I have been given those facilities. Uh, that has mainly been at the same time as the Treasury is making such facilities available to local authorities in England. The Not all requests have been approved um, by me um, because of the tests that I applied to the, the, the wisdom and the, the merits of these applications um, and whether they actually do constitute um, a, appropriate um, examples for borrowing purposes. Um, but certainly if local authorities had any issues in relation to this in particular question, um, I would be happy to consider those representations and, and if I was satisfied by their terms, to make representations to Her Majesty's Treasury. Thank you very much for that response. One of the other issues that comes up, uh, Deputy First Minister, is the issue regarding the council tax freeze. Uh, and a number of local authorities uh, on an annual basis uh, in one respect condemn the council tax freeze, on the other hand they welcome the council tax freeze. Uh, in relation to the figure that's been set aside, an, an increasing figure each year of £70 million, pounds, is that sustainable in the longer term and is there any light at the end of the tunnel in relation to the continued use of the council tax freeze and additional resources being freed up uh, by yourself to allow local authorities to meet what local authorities argue as increasing demands on services which are not being directly met by the monies being made available through the council tax freeze settlements. The, the, the government has a manifesto commitment, as Mr Wilson will be aware, aware to continue the council tax freeze uh, during the lifetime of this parliament and, and we've um, put in place the measures in 1516 to enable us to fulfil that commitment and I obviously encourage local authorities to uh, take the decision to freeze the council tax. It is of course their decision, it's not one that I can uh, impose upon local authorities. But what we do is we compensate local authorities for the revenue foregone, and we have done that in all circumstances. Uh, the, uh, obviously, you know, the, the, there will be um, debates about the effectiveness of this, but we have to take into account the fact that this has provided real tangible support to householders 
um, after a period in which the council tax had, re had increased very significantly. And um, the, the, the key part of the agreement that we reached with local government is that the Scottish government would compensate um, local authorities for the um, the loss of revenue as a consequence of the council tax freeze. Deputy First Minister, the, one of the issues that's been raised with us is the issue of the, flash ca the flat cash settlement, uh, as local authorities have described it. Uh, and one of the areas where uh, the government, Scottish Government hoped would offset that uh, flat cash settlement was the issue of NDRI uh, and the expected increase in income uh, through those means. Uh, clearly, the, f the latest figures we have show that we did not achieve as much in terms of collection uh, through the non-domestic rates revenue that was expected. Uh, have you taken any account of, uh, in the budget, if there is a failure to collect by local authorities uh, the rates uh, that were predicted to be collected? Uh, and would local authorities be compensated if the calculations uh, were wrongly attributed to lo local authorities? The first point I'd make is, is just on the, the, the description of the local settlement is flat cash, and I, 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 I hear these shorthand statements, but uh, you know, the, the, the local authority budget was $10.6 billion in 2014-15. It'll be $10.8 billion in 2015-16, so... There's nothing flat about that. It's gone up by two hundred million pounds. I'm simply, I'm simply, I'm. I'm, 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 I'm I have no intention of shooting the messenger. I'm, I'm, I'm merely pointing out that uh, I hear these 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 words getting uh, shared around, and, and you know the, the the budget is actually going up. Um, on the question about non-domestic rates, and I, th I think I said in my earlier remarks that uh, the government assures, guarantees local authorities for the non-domestic rates income. So if there's a, a shortfall, then it's a shortfall I've got to make good. And um, as I set out in my statement to Parliament when I announced the budget, when I, um, over the years in which I have been um, making an estimate of non-domestic rates income, if the committee will bear with me for one second, I shall try to find the reference in my statement to Parliament. Um, between 2008 and 2014, the difference between the total amount of non-domestic rates income received and the estimated budget that I had put in place was three-tenths of one percent, £40 million out of £13.1 billion. And I had actually underestimated. Um, you know, we got a surplus uh, always nice to have, but uh, uh, so uh, I think we're we, we put a lot of effort into trying to forecast in cooperation with local authorities uh, some of the levels of non-domestic rates income that can be achieved. And uh, but obviously we provide that guarantee to local government in the bargain. Thank you very much. No further questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I asked the previous panel uh, the question. Uh, round about the statement made by the president of COSLA, uh, who, uh, in a paraphrase, said that local government here was getting uh, a fair deal compared to uh, councils south of the border. Um, would you like to comment on that, uh, Deputy First Minister? Well, what, what I'd say about that is it's nice to hear, but he doesn't always say that when he's in the room with me. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll look carefully at, at, uh, at Councillor O'Neill's press cuttings, but uh, it certainly, uh, well, uh, to, to, be, to be fair about it, I, I have to say that I have, um, in the course of my discussions with the uh, local authority leaders in Scotland, I've always found um, local authority leaders to put forward um, a, a, a considered case about the financial situation of local authorities, uh, but also have found them prepared to accept the fact that the government wrestles with difficult financial challenges uh, as well as local authorities wrestling with difficult financial challenges um, and to to come to agreements around about that. And it's been a, a, an issue of, um, I think, well, for me, uh, great personal satisfaction that since 2007 we have been able to reach an agreed settlement with local government about its financial support, which certainly my period as an opposition member um, in Parliament 
I, I, I never once witnessed um, an agreed local authority settlement between the Scottish Executive and local government. So it's been a particular priority to, to try to achieve that, and I'm glad we've been able to do so. I'm sure that uh, uh, COSLA members will be glad to hear that uh, Mr O'Neill is a, a good negotiator in the room. Can I thank you very much uh, for appearing here today? I know that there uh, was a clash of commitments today uh, with your Smith Commission obligations, and we're very grateful uh, that you managed to come at this time. Uh, I now suspend and we move into private session.